Usually in video games, even AAA studio developed titles, there's bound to be a few bugs here and there. Glitches, exploits, you name it. Don't get me started on how glitchy modern games are. These things are released almost in a beta or alpha state, with a fix it later on kind of approach. But even before the infamous launches of Fallout 76 and Cyberpunk 2077, there's always been glitches and bugs in games. Some less noticeable than others, and some completely game-breaking. Some are funny, some are creepy, and sometimes can even make the the game better in a way. However, there is one title with bugs so insane, so cryptic, mysterious, and creepy that it has cemented itself as one of the most fascinating gaming mysteries in my opinion, despite it being a fairly unknown topic, at least outside of Japan, where it is rather infamous. A set of glitches so unnerving and mysterious that many people believe the game itself may be haunted or even cursed. A game which possibly propelled one of its developers into utter madness and insanity, and involves a huge conspiracy around one of Japan's biggest game studios. And that game is Kamaitachi no Yoru 2. Now, before we get to the cursed title itself, we need to take a look back on the first entry in this series of games, that being Kamaitachi no Yoru, translated in English as Banshee's Last Cry. Although a more direct translation would be something like Night of the Sickle Weasel or just Night of the Kamaitachi, a Japanese yokai or supernatural entity found in Japanese folklore. The first game was released all the way back in 1994 for the Super Famicom, however the only official English release of the game was a translation and port for Android and iOS by Axis Games in 2014. The game sold very well for a sound novel as the company Chunsoft refers to them as, which essentially are the same thing as visual novels. You know, lots of text, minimal gameplay, but typically a few choices, multiple endings and routes, that kind of thing. The game even got a remake in 2017. So what's it about, and how does this relate to the second game in the series? Well, it doesn't very much, which is kind of interesting. I mean, it does, but it's not a standard sequel, but don't worry, we'll get to that a little bit later. But the first game is a sort of murder mystery where the protagonist, Toru, visits a hotel with his girlfriend before they're snowed in during a storm, and have to figure out who killed one of the guests there at the lodge. Overall, it's a pretty well-received game, although it didn't get much attention outside of Japan, thanks to translations being pretty hard to come by. However, where this really gets interesting is the second game, Kamaitachi no Yoru 2. Really Released in Japan in 2002 for the PlayStation 2. It was once again published by Chunsoft and was also a sound novel, and got a few Japanese exclusive ports later on down the line. However, this title was not your standard sequel and continuation of the first one. In fact, it had a completely different story. There was also a third installment in the franchise in Kamaitachi no Yoru Triple, also released for the PS2 in 2006, but this entry is probably the most obscure out of all of them, and there isn't very much info on it online. However, for from what I've gathered, this game acts as a sort of sequel to the second title, and stars Toru and his girlfriend once again with another cast of supporting characters and a brand new murder mystery. However, getting back to the second and most interesting of all of them, Kamaitachi no Yoru 2 takes place in an alternate reality, where the first game in the series is, well, a video game in-universe, which is based on a true story, although none of these characters or rather people died, but they all still do exist. Following so far? I know, it's pretty confusing. So now now, the developer of the first game in real life and in universe, Takemaru Abiko, invites the guests of the original incident that inspired the game to a remote island called Mikazuki Island. However, when they arrive, the author is nowhere to be found, and not only that, but someone is trying to kill the guests on the island. It's sort of a fun meta-narrative revolving around the first title, while simultaneously kind of reimagining it. However, adding to this strange kind of storytelling, the plot also takes on some supernatural elements, which were not featured in the first game. But I won't really get into any story-specific spoilers here, because they are completely relevant to the topic of this video, and secondly, even if I wanted to, these games are so obscure and hard to find translations of that I would be hard pressed to do so. Point is, they're murder mystery visual novels. The second game is a little weirder and more meta than the first, but nothing too crazy, right? Well, one part of these games that I neglected to mention up until now is that when you complete certain endings, especially in the second game, you're typically rewarded with a colored bookmark, each of which have different meanings. For example, in the first game you would receive a pink bookmark if you achieved all the good endings, and there's also a similar system in the second game, including a blue, pink, and even a gold bookmark, which is the most important one, and is acquired after achieving all endings. Which is an incredible undertaking, I'm talking 105 endings across 11 
different scenarios, all of which require specific choices throughout the game and collecting the various different bookmarks. But if you manage to complete this task, you are rewarded with a golden bookmark. What does it do, you might wonder? Well, nothing. Actually, not exactly, but upon first glance booting up the game again, it may seem like nothing's changed, like it's just some sort of accolade or achievement to show you made it through every possible route in the game. But for some, this is what they were greeted with upon booting up the game once again. The game glitches suddenly, and then you're met with four ominous choices. Shout out to Base Skater and Plague Dr. Liza, by the way. They also did videos on this game and provided some better translations for this screen and its various choices. Anyway, the choices you are given are A. Become Cursed B. Suffer C. Be Cautious or D. Why Will You Die? Now, apparently picking each choice can lead to any of the four different screens and it's seemingly random which one you'll get no matter your choice. The first one seems quite benign, and simply shows a still image of a woman on the beach for a few frames before returning to the gameplay. However, it's the other screens where it really gets bizarre, starting with this one. We can see some sort of blue head fade in and out, kind of similar to the blue silhouette signature to this series of games, while some sort of electricity sound is heard in the background, and a long and pretty creepy story is displayed via white text. It reads, quote, Unlike before, I could see something like an expression, its eyes, its nose, its mouth all told only one story, resentment. The curse was like venom dripping from its face like sweat. She screamed. I don't remember exactly how I intercepted it, or how I got back home, but I found myself in my usual room with the TV screen in front of me. Hadn't you ever heard that Kamai Tachi no Yoru 2 was a cursed game? Well, it didn't matter if I had or not, it's already started. I had heard rumors. The staff had told me that they heard strange voices. Some people had seen some distorted human faces. It's a new direction, I used to say with a laugh, but I had been staring at the monitor for almost an hour. Yes, just like you are now. However, my position was a little different. I was a scenario writer for the game. I was the first person to play it with a debug ROM, and the production effects were excellent. It was going to be an interesting game if I had to say so myself. When I first saw the figure, I didn't think much of it. I saw something flickering on the other side of the monitor. I looked over and saw nothing. But when I started looking at the monitor, it appeared. It looked like a doll. It seemed to be asking me what I was doing. I was playing the game in front of the staff room of Chunsoft. It was after 11pm, but there were still some employees left, so I naturally assumed that it was one of them. Still, the reason it remained in my memory was because I had heard voices at the same time. I heard a gravelly whisper in my ear but I had no idea what it was saying. I looked around in panic, but there was no one there. From that day on, I began to see the doll more often. Behind the showroom of the store, or in the window of the apartment building that I looked up at, on the subway platform, on the other side of the street, behind the table where I was eating. The man just became bolder and bolder. He reaches his arm through a pile of documents, peering through the doorway of a room, something like a finger appearing from a closed book. It was a vague bluish shadow, and through the shadow I could see behind me. Soon I began to hear their voices. It was that shrill whisper I had heard at first. I thought I was sick. I went to the doctor and was told I was neurotic. The deadline for Kamai Tachi was approaching. Day after day, the director scolded me, the producer yelled at me, and the programmers were sarcastic with me. I was tired. I got a mood stabilizer and went home. The next day, I invited a female friend to dinner for the first time in a while. It was on my way home when we found a print machine off the street that seems to have been left behind. I pressed the button, and the print came out. There was the face of a pallid man. The image was from Kamai Tachi no Yoru 2. It was then I realized that I knew who they were. There were corpses in a vast labyrinth of text. They were the characters killed in Kamai Tachi no Yoru 2. The characters that were killed over and over again behind the monitor in various brutal ways. They're coming to take revenge on me and everyone involved with the game. That's right. I heard a voice. And at the same time, a face appeared on the monitor. I couldn't tell if it was Midori, Mari, or Kayama, but I remember the sound of many people laughing, and the feel of a hard, cold hand on my shoulder, and I was supposed to have disappeared. My name was erased from the staff roll, and only the name of the person who took my place remained, but I myself did not disappear from the game. I'm still here. Now my story is over. If you haven't heard them yet, you can still get there in time, if you haven't heard their voices yet. So then, what does this all mean? 
Well, while it might sound kind of nonsensical and cryptic, this is probably actually the easiest of all of them to put some sort of narrative together with, because at least it appears as one relatively consistent story of a writer working on Kame Tachi no Yoru 2, who describes seeing some sort of ghostly blue figure in the game while playing it, leading him to believe that the game is cursed and that he's being haunted by this entity. He describes how all of this started as some sort of a rumor, co-workers reporting strange voices and sightings of this being, which he laughed off but after a while it becomes very real for him. It honestly reads like some kind of old school creepypasta. With him encountering the entity outside of the game and even printing out his face, he believed that the characters in the game were coming to take revenge on him for killing them off in so many different ways in the scenarios that he wrote. And he believes that the blue entity is one of these disgruntled characters, before he is seemingly pulled somehow into the game world and disappears from the staff at Shunsoft. And remember how he also mentioned using a debug ROM? Well, if you access the debug menu in the real game using an emulator, you can find some really interesting images that were seemingly never meant to be found, hidden away in the files. Pictures that coincide with the writer's story, almost every step of the way, including him seeing the figure on his monitor in his real life, him going to get the medicine to help with the anxiety, finding the printer thing, and eventually him seemingly being sucked into the game by this blue entity. And while all this is pretty creepy, there's still quite a bit to delve into, so I'll save my overall thoughts for after we look into the additional glitch screens. And while that last one had kind of a cohesive storyline, this one here is a bit more ambiguous and harder to decipher. A loud ringing sound can be heard for the duration of the screen, while some sort of blue wavy textures move in the background. While text displays reading, quote, Please listen to me as I suffer. Please. There's a big problem in the memory storage layer of the universe, in the Akashic Records. It is a psychic. I cough blood, my head cracks. It is hard to get the brain out. My tongue is cut. I've written many things, so they make me write. There's a lot of obstruction, but it can't be helped. I contacted Mr. Sakihawa at the Ministry of Justice, but there was interference. It was Christmas when I found the green-colored poison running on the airwaves on December 25th, and I knew Christ as the Messiah. I knew that Christ was the Messiah. That's why they bled and ripped open the belly and took out the yellow ball of fat. It was like dissecting a frog. They controlled us, they really coerced us, and they even coaxed us into buying some pretty expensive programs. They were able to trick me into buying a very expensive program because they were eating up some kind of spiritual light. If you can't hear the command to stop before you feel uncomfortable, or if you don't trust them, it's because you've got a cushioning membrane attached to the back of your head. So how can you remove it? If you can't hear or trust the command to stop while you still have the feeling, it's because you've got a palliative membrane attached to the back of your head. Let me tell you how to remove it or break it. First, put some soft mud between your fingernails on the ring finger of your right hand, then tie in a chrome wire around your wrist and insert the other end into a tangerine. Insert it or get a gouge needle, it will not bleed. It will pierce a little hole in the flank. It not bleeding is evidence that a causating palliative membrane is affixed to the back of the head. The fact that it does not bleed is proof that the irritation membrane has been applied to the back of the head. There's plenty of evidence. That is why I appealed to Mr. Sakihawa and the Ministry of Justice with this evidence. The fact that he does not take me seriously is proof that I am right, but I am more worried about Mr. Sakihawa. It is they who take advantage of my kindness, so let's heed this warning. I have become Onisaburo Deguchi. I'm going to be hit on the head with the whip. It is hell. It is very hellish, so be careful. I have become Onisaburo Deguchi. It will be shriveled up and your head will be broken, so be careful. I have become Onisaburo Deguchi. You'll be shaken to pieces as your head will be broken. It is hell. Very hellish, so be careful. If you cannot do such a thing, you are damned. If you can, you can't help it if you're cursed. Okay, so what did I just read? A lot of what is said here is hard to understand compared with the first story, right? But a few things we are able to make out. First of all, it appears this person writing this is also some sort of writer, possibly the same one. Although this person seems a lot more mentally scarred and disoriented, writing almost nonsense, talking about poisonous radio waves on Christmas, saying fat was being removed from their stomach, that some device is attached to the back of their head, and of course how you go about removing it, which involves a very strange process. A few clues are present though, including a few notable names. First he talks about a Mr. Sakihawa with the Ministry of Justice, although I couldn't find any notable people with that name. But the other one that's brought up quite a few times is Onisaburo Deguchi, with the narrator claiming that they have become him. 
And this is actually a real person, one of the most influential spiritual leaders in Japan in the early 1900s, founding the Omoto religion, originating from Shinto. He was arrested a few times, and Omoto was actually persecuted as well in the 30s and 40s, but I couldn't really find any solid connection between that religion and this text. Although in here it makes it seem like the author is part of some kind of insane cult, which the writer refers to as simply they. Having these strange devices attached to their heads, performing these weird rituals, and even cutting off parts of their tongues, having pieces of fat removed, being whipped, it's all just so bizarre. It doesn't even seem like it connects to the other story about the scenario writer and the blue entity, at least at first glance, although it does at the end reference some kind of curse. But it also talks about how he believed that Christ was the Messiah, which he actually repeats a few times in the text, and also even references the Akashic Records, a concept from Theosophy and Anthroposophy separate religious and spiritual movements, concerning a sort of collection of everything that has ever happened or will happen in the universe. But how is all of this even connected? Well, to be honest, I don't know. But we'll get into that more at the end. First, we need to take a look at the final and creepiest scene in the game. Although, keep in mind, a lot of this is becoming quite unintelligible. But regardless, we have this. The right choice, you think? Whatever the case, the murder has nothing to do with you, right? You don't have anything to do with it, right? From now on, from this moment on, you will truly suffer. You're really frightened. You're terrified. That abomination that I saw at the end, that gouged out my eyes, that disgusting voice, the sound of its torn arm being chewed on, the sound of its guts being pulled from its stomach, it's yours. Now, what could that possibly mean, other than it being pretty unsettling imagery? Well, to be honest, this one is truly an enigma. The most disturbing part of this, though, is not the text itself, or even the distorted screams or screeches in the background, but rather the flashing images that appear on screen, as most of them are apparently from various Japanese gore films, some of the most disgusting and disturbing movies ever made, like those of the Guinea Pig series, which some even thought at some point was real snuff, and even the Tumbling Doll of Flesh, said to be one of the most extremely violent and disgusting films ever made. Although it's hard to tell where every single image came from, and I'm sure most, if not all of them, have equally disturbing origins. But as far as what the text says, it's hard to make out what's even trying to be conveyed here. But maybe it is that same writer being tortured by the blue entity. So then, how does this all fit together? Well, if you're looking for answers, let me just say I don't have anything definitive. This really is one of the most mysterious gaming rabbit holes I've ever seen, and it isn't even that well known, and a lot of the info out there hasn't even been translated. There are a few videos on it, and the biggest coverage came from an odd header video focused on strange gaming discoveries, and I'll admit that's where I first heard about this, but I had no idea back then how much there was to this mystery. And to really try and tie everything together, there is one more hidden message we need to take a look at. One I neglected to talk about in the beginning because this message isn't found in this game, but rather it's a secret found in the first one. Again, if you manage to acquire the golden bookmark by getting all the endings in the first title, and manage to follow a set of vertical hidden instructions, you are led to press the reset button at a very specific point in time, which will cause a very strange and creepy message to abruptly appear over a black background. The text reads something like, quote, I do not know who is reading this right now. Are you a child, an adult, a man, or a woman? Considering the demographic of this game, a high school aged boy is probably the most likely candidate. In any case, I sincerely hope that you're just an ordinary person who bought this software for the pure enjoyment of the game and not one of them. I do not know who you are, but I'm sure you know who I am. At the very least, you must have seen my name on the package or in the staff role of this game. My name is Takemaru Abiko. No. Actually, I am the real author behind the person known by that name. That is me. My picture may appear on the package or in the manual, but it's not me. I'm not one of them who speak my name. I wrote almost the entirety of Kame Itachi no Yoru in a room in Shunsoft's office, and I'm writing this while pretending to be at work and under their watchful eyes. Yes, they are the employees of Chunsoft. To be honest, I started out as one of them, a Chunsoft employee. However, as I participated in the production of Kame Itachi no Yoru and the project progressed, I became aware of the true nature of this company and its horrific schemes. I, of course, tried to escape, but they seized me just as I was about to do so. Since then, I've been locked up in this room and forced to work. 
Conveniently for them, I had no relatives and few friends in society, so there would be no one to look for me. As soon as the job is over, I will be killed. So as you're reading this, I'm probably already dead by their hands. I've tried many times to escape from here, but each time I was caught and subjected to numerous tortures that I could not even recall. I no longer have any hope of surviving, but I am writing this to tell the world about their conspiracy and how to stop it. I have hidden this message behind an ordinary game that can only be found by cracking the code, so that it can be passed on to those from the outside without being seen by them. We thought we could pass the information on to the outside world without them seeing it. I wish I could put this message in the master ROM, but that's not possible in my position. At best, I would have to replace one or two cases of ROMs. I have no idea if anyone will ever receive this message, and even if they do, I have no idea if they will believe me. There is no guarantee that it will not be checked before shipping and be destroyed by them. But let's not worry about that. I'll keep writing this in the hope that some good person is reading it. You've probably heard the term subliminal messages somewhere. Sounds too small to be heard, images too brief to be recognized, and other imperceptible stimuli that influence the subconscious mind. They have attempted to experiment with subliminal messaging in video games before. The first of these was a game called Otogiriso. The embedded messages were relatively trivial. The message was that Shunsoft software is fun. The idea was to ship the embedded message in the non-embedded software to different regions, and then compare the sales with the next release to see how well it sold. The results of this experiment were confirmed by the game Tornico's Great Adventure. The sales in the areas where the message embedded software was shipped were remarkable. Even at this stage, as you can see, there were still some commercial moral issues, but they were not really aiming for anything more than a modest business success. They wanted to brainwash the young people who would eventually become the future of Japan into being enthusiastic supporters of Chunsoft. By the time the children who played this game became adults, Chunsoft will be more than just a video game company. It will be a religious corporation, a political organization, and a multinational conglomerate. When this happens, brainwashed youths will worship Koichi Nakamura as a god, vote for the Chunsoft party, and continue to play Chunsoft games while eating Chunsoft instant food. That is what they are all about. To control the whole of Japan in all aspects, the economy, politics, and faith. We know it sounds like a laughable story, but it is true. In fact, if you've played the software several times already, you must have a strange sense of trust in Chunsoft. If you've played it less than 10 times, you may have not yet been brainwashed. If you're reading this after 20 or 30 times, you probably won't believe anything I say. However, this is a fact. Someone needs to expose their conspiracy. It's simple. All it takes is one phone call to this number I'm about to give you. The number of my only friend that I can truly trust. Tell him everything. That's all you need to do. There is no danger. On the contrary, telling him puts you in less danger. I thought about keeping quiet because I didn't want to scare anyone, but that doesn't seem to be an option. Even if I could slip this message into dozens of the games, they would eventually realize that the numbers don't add up. Even if I could slip this message into dozens of software cassettes and slip it into a normal one, they would eventually realize that the numbers don't add up. Then it would be easy for them to trace the software back to the retailer. If it was bought from a small store, they will find out right away. If you bought it at a mass retailer and didn't pre-order, don't worry, they will be able to locate all your software within a month of its release. If it has been more than a month since you bought it, then you were definitely under their watchful eye. High performance directional microphones, thermal imaging cameras, and the like are surely out there watching you right outside your room. Wait, don't even think about looking out your window. You'll be the perfect target for a rifle. Don't stand by the window. All you have to do is crawl on the floor to the phone and call my friend. They are right outside, wondering if they should silence you now that you have found this message. There is no time. Once you make the call and tell them everything, they will kill you. So you must make the call if you are to survive. And if you don't do it fast, they will come pretending to be a newspaper collector or posing as an electrician. I hear their footsteps outside. Wow, that was a lot, and probably the easiest of all these crazy messages to understand, really. Basically, the writer who worked on the first game is actually the one who wrote the whole game, but was put into captivity by Chunsoft after he discovered their conspiracy and replaced him with Takemaru Abiko as the new face of the game. He discovered that the company Chunsoft was putting subliminal messages in their games in order to take over Japan by brainwashing the youth into loving everything they do, which would then allow them to expand into politics and food and create a huge corporate 
corporation capable of taking over the country. Yes, it sounds like the ramblings of a crazed madman, especially how he explains that the company is watching not only his every move, but the player who reads this message as well, having cameras and microphones ready to silence anyone that learns of their secret. Also, who was the friend of the developer that he wanted the player to contact? He doesn't even give a number in his monologue as far as I can tell. But before we get into all that, let me just say what you're probably all thinking at this point. It's pretty obvious that none of these messages are glitches, or anything more than some kind of elaborate easter egg created by someone working on the games. That's not to say everyone on the team was involved though. In fact, at first glance that doesn't seem to be the case, because even though this is a pretty outlandish conspiracy theory being put out about the company, would Chunsoft even allow this kind of deprecating easter egg to even be put in the game, even if it's just part of some alternate reality storytelling? Which leads me to think that maybe this was done by one person, who maybe was truly insane and thought Chunsoft was part of some kind of conspiracy, but we all know the more likely answer is someone just really wanted to leave a really creepy and cryptic easter egg very hidden in the game. Something that would only be discovered most likely years later without Chunsoft finding out, as it doesn't seem something that they would take kindly to. But wait, hold that thought, because there's more. There's a PS1 port of the game which came out four years later in December 1998 that leads me to think otherwise. Because in this version, if the same easter egg is repeated, but this time you press select select instead of reset, you can view a new message which continues the author's story on the conspiracy. Quote, I am still alive. Perhaps I should thank God for that. In 1994, when Kamai Tachi no Yoru was released for the Super Famicom, I, the original author, managed to slip a secret document into one of its cassettes to stop a terrible conspiracy. But let's get back to the story. Of course, within a few days of the launch, my actions were discovered by them, and I was subjected to all sorts of torture in the company torture room. However, I am sure that the message was read by hundreds of users, some of whom took action to stop the conspiracy. But it seems that Chunsoft's ambitions had not been crushed. This time, their re-releasing Kameatachi no Yoru as a PlayStation game. As a result, I was dragged out of my basement cell for the first time in four years to help with the porting process. Naturally, I could not use the reset button which had been hidden in the previous accusation document. I had no choice but to create a new hiding place by pretending to rewrite the text. How many users will find their way here? If this gets out, I'll be killed this time. All I can do now is pray to the heavens for luck. I only hope that you, who are reading this right now, will survive and stop the conspiracy. So, was Chunsoft and the whole development team really in on this insane easter egg? Possibly so. The fact that it's in two releases of the game means if it was only one guy doing this, he wasn't caught for the first easter egg and continued to put them in the new port, even including a recap and a choice where you can view the original message to get all caught up on the lore. But in this message, we don't really learn much additional information, other than that in his description of events, he was caught for putting the easter egg in the original 1994 release and was subsequently chained up for four years before being forced to work on the new port of the game. However, it doesn't really make sense that he would hide the secret in the same spot. Like, he says he can't use the same button, but like, shouldn't it be hidden somewhere else than instead of in the same place in the game? Also, Chunsoft, which is now called Spike Chunsoft in modern day, is actually known to have quite a few ARGs, even one made pretty recently, so it isn't too far-fetched to say they could have collaborated on it, although when asked about these strange easter eggs to add fuel to the fire, they will never comment on it. But with that all being said, are any of these messages even connected, or are they separate easter eggs possibly created by different people or the same guy, as to just have some kind of one-off scare? Or is there some kind of overall narrative? Well the sad truth is, I have no idea. The messages are just too cryptic and hard to understand, not to mention it being translated from Japanese to English, so a lot of the subtle characteristics and nuances are definitely lost on me in these monologues. But what I can say is that it seems this initial easter egg from the first game is separate to those from the second, although it's very likely that they were inspired by the original conspiracy messages, which tells the story of the game's writer trying to stop a Chunsoft subliminal message conspiracy. Maybe this could be the same writer featured in the story about the scenario writer from the second game, but this doesn't seem likely, as just like the game itself, that story takes on a much more supernatural approach with the blue entity rather than focusing on the Chunsoft conspiracy. Although that message about some sort of cult that the writer was embroiled in may be related to Chunsoft, because he describes how it will be 
become a religious organization, with Koichi Nakamura, who is a real game developer, becoming a godlike figure. And in both that conspiracy message, as well as the one found in the second game on the ringing screen, it refers to a group just called Them, referring to both this potential cult and Chunsoft respectively. Meaning they could be one and the same, but to be honest, I don't really think any of them are related. I think these are just some creepy reality bending easter eggs hidden for those fans who go deep enough into the game to give them a good scare. But who really knows, because I have a feeling we aren't really getting the full picture here. Remember, there is a third game, and if these two are anything to go off of, there's probably some hidden messages in that game too. But since there isn't much gameplay or English translations available, I can't really know for sure, and maybe there's even more easter eggs and messages that have yet to be found in the first two games. We already saw how in Kameitachi no Yoru 2, there were those unused images that were related to the story of the scenario writer, suggesting that the story and easter egg were meant to play a much bigger role role or even be expanded. Or maybe they were really just hidden that deep on purpose. I mean, the messages do talk about the ROM debugging a few times. Either way, this is definitely one of the most interesting and creepy easter eggs I've ever seen in a game before. So hopefully Chunsoft doesn't kill me. <laughs>